call are very likely familiar with PCB piezotronics. Uh, if you're not, just a quick uh, few bullet points about who we are. We were founded in 1967. Um, we're headquartered in Depew, New York, which is probably about 20 minutes outside of downtown Buffalo, New York. We are vertically integrated, and by that, I mean we control all of our components, our processes, and subsequent quality for, for all of the products that we make, um, right from machining through to assembly. We have a 50,000 square foot machine center, which uh, you know we do make all of our own components. You can actually see on the lower right photo there on the bottom is our machine center, and then across the parking lot is our headquarters. And you can see a better picture of the headquarters above that than the shot with the flag. We have manufacturing facilities both in here in, in the Buffalo area as well as in North Carolina. Um, many of you know we acquired Indevco in 2019 to expand our product portfolio and give us some, some products that we had holes in our offering for, so we now have a much rounder offering in terms of products. We are widely considered to be a, a leader in sensor technology for industrial applications, power gen, energy applications, aerospace and defense, automotive, et cetera. If you are not familiar with us and you are interested in getting a, a brief overview of who we are and our capabilities are, we have just recently released a new video that talks about just that, you know, what our capabilities are, how we differentiate ourselves from our competitors, et cetera. So simply go to that link and it's about a three or four minute video and it'll give you a good feel for uh, who we are and what we're all about. About me. Um, so again, my name is Vic Viola. I uh, have about nine years in uh, experience in the industrial sensor market. And my focus has been on condition monitoring for that time. I am currently the Director of Sales and Marketing at PCB, IMI Sensors. I'm responsible for global sales and marketing for uh, the predictive maintenance product line, along with the process monitoring and protection and control products. Um, so that's my, my role. And the organizers of the event have asked all of the presenters to provide a couple fun facts about us. So here's a couple about me. I was a DJ. I uh, actually funded most of my college through, uh, through that DJ assignment. I was pretty busy back, back in the day and it was a lot of fun. And um, what's fun is I still have all of my equipment and my 2000 vinyl record collection, which my daughters are endlessly fascinated with. Um, the second one is I ended up having the good fortune of having dinner with Denzel Washington in LA. And I'll give you the, the 90 second how that happened without getting too in, into details. I had attended a trade show in Los Angeles and I went by myself and a friend had recommended a really great restaurant for sushi because I love sushi. It's called Matsuhisa. Very popular place, very high end place. And uh, I decided to go show up at the, at the door, the hostess greets me and the place is packed. And I said, you know, table for one or whatever. She looked at me, kind of rolled her eyes and said, well, I can seat you over at the bar at the end there, you know, like where the, the sushi chef is passing the plates to the wait staff. I said, yeah, that's fine, I'll take it. So I sit down and I pick up the menu and I'm, you know, absorbing the sticker shock and the pricing. And I hear this voice that I recognize. And I turn to my right and I'm sitting next to Denzel Washington and, and a friend of his who ended up being a stuntman. So I'm sitting there having the mental calculation of how do I play this? Do I pretend I'm not sitting next to Denzel? Do I, you know, what do I do here? Do I, you know, say hi? And he solved the problem for me. He actually turned to me and introduced himself and his friend, the nicest guy. He asked me where I was from, what I was doing in, in LA, blah, blah, blah. And bottom line is he ended up recommending a ton of different you know, sushi items from the menu, bought my dinner for me, and uh, just ended up having you know, 45 minutes of fun talking to one of the most famous actors in the world. But the best part of the story is um, we, my wife and I had just had our second daughter, and I called home back to Buffalo. And uh, she answers the phone, and I hear the baby crying in the background, and I said, hi, honey. Um, if you ever wanted to ask Denzel Washington any questions, now would be a real good time because I'm having dinner with him. And needless to say, she was not impressed, but she 
she was very happy. So I went back and sat down and I told Denzel, I just talked to my wife and she's gotta be honest, pretty jealous of me right now. And so he ended up writing on a napkin, a note to her saying, don't be too hard on him. He's just working real hard, love Denzel. And yeah, she has it framed. So that's my dinner with Denzel story. So on to the session. So I'll be talking about customers who've gone with a wireless system and you know, referencing our Echo wireless system specifically. Why did they choose wireless? You know, there's plenty of wired solutions out there. There's, you know, a ton of different ways you can monitor vibration on your, on your plant facility assets. Why wireless? So I'll talk a bit about what some of the circumstances were that drove them in that direction. Um, and as the session title suggested, I'll talk about how you can, if you've already invested in wired accelerometers, there's a path forward for you to convert those to wireless very easily. I'll, I'll go through that a bit. Um, what a comprehensive system offers, you know, we'll talk about the components of, of our system uh, as a reference. Um, it's always good to have some application information and install details. Um, I'll talk about uh, some new things coming for us specifically with respect to cloud-based access to, to wireless data. And I'm guessing there'll be some questions and answers. Hopefully there'll be enough time for all of them. So why consider wireless? You know, in terms of the primary benefits of going with a wireless technology, I guess at a very macro level, these are sort of the top three that we've experienced. Um, it definitely reduces downtime and lost productivity. And I'll talk about how in, in the coming slides. Um, certainly simplifies installation and, and reduces your monitoring costs, especially when you're looking at, you know, wireless versus a wired solution. And I think most importantly, which I would say the number one reason why our customers have chosen our wireless system is because it allows for safe data collection in dangerous areas, and in some instances, very dangerous areas. So let's look at the first one, reduces downtime and lost productivity. Um, if you think about it, you're going to, using a wireless system, you're gonna get earlier warning of machine problems. Um, if you compare a traditional, you know, route-based data collection scenario, you know, one reading per month, you know, or, or even per quarter, some of our customers take one vibration reading per quarter, and look at the trends over time to see you know, if there's any increases in vibration levels. With a wireless system, you're looking at, you know, the average is three readings per day. Obviously, with that much more data, you're going to see defects developing a lot sooner, which gives you the, the time to react to those defects and hopefully avoid a catastrophic failure of those machines. And the other, the, the other, the other question that begs to be answered is why take vibration readings on healthy machines? Um, I typically talk to customers uh, about our wireless system and I always ask them the same question. On average, you know, if you took 100 readings, you know, 100 points in your plant, how many of them come back with problems? You know, either, you know, sort of significant issues or even minor issues. And the answer always seems to be, you know, maybe one or two out of 100. So again, that begs the question, if 98% of your machinery and your plant is healthy, why take readings on it, you know, with a data collection route? And that's where wireless can really assist people in, in improving efficiency. Um, you're not wasting time by taking readings on healthy machinery. It frees up your, your you know, data collection folks to, to do some fault analysis and focus on areas where, you know, there, there's help really needed. It simplifies installation and reduces monitoring costs, you know, hands down. Um, when you look at the cost of running cable in a facility, it's, it's extremely expensive. I had the good fortune of, of having lunch with a, a customer at uh, a trade show a few years back, and he shared some cost points, which just about knocked me off my chair. At his facility, which was a nuclear facility, he was looking at a $1,400 per foot expense of putting in cable, which is just ridiculous. Um, so wireless certainly you know, is much more cost effective when you're looking at that versus you know, running cable, especially in a facility like that. You can certainly monitor more assets with less human resource. I mean, some of the facilities I've been to have been just jaw dropping. For example, you know, refineries down in Texas. I, I went to one, did a, a presentation on our system and they had 55,000 points 
that they were trying to take readings on with a handheld data collector with a route with a team of five people. You're simply not going to be able to get to all of that machinery and catch defects. You're going to have things go down and hopefully it won't be you know, production impacting because that gets expensive. Um, it allows for monitoring points that are difficult to routinely access. You know, um, another experience I had was here in Buffalo as a tire manufacturer. They were looking at our system and you know, sort of doing a site survey, walking around what they wanted to monitor. They were having rooftop fan motors fail. So we were out there in the winter, you know, trying to understand what he was looking to accomplish. And he's going out there, you know, every month taking data vibration readings. And it's just ridiculous and dangerous. So we, we put in a wireless system for it, solves up that problem for them. And you can monitor remotely located machinery much easier. You know, most manufacturing facilities seem to have a cooling tower or two, you know, kind of a half mile down the road. And no one wants to drive down the road in the wintertime, climb up the stairs, go inside the tower, take readings with a handheld data collector. It's just, it's dangerous and it's, it's just ridiculous. A wireless system, absolute perfect solution to solve for those kinds of, of assets. And as I said, it allows for safe data collection in, in dangerous environments. I mean, things have changed drastically in recent years from a regulatory standpoint, where, you know, five, six, seven years ago, you might be able to go into a paper mill and, you know, near the dryer section and, you know, stick your hand out and take a reading on something that's 325 degrees, you know, two inches away from you, but not anymore. The liabilities are, are, are real and they're, they're, you know, they're tremendous. Um, so when you look at a wireless system, you know, it solves for all that. You can take um, readings in high temp areas, uh, extreme height, and you can sort of define danger in any, any flavor you'd like. Um, there's many plants with machinery with rotating or moving parts where, you know, reliability staff could certainly get snagged and caught in and you know, get very seriously hurt if not killed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another area is you know, hard to reach areas, like for example, between machinery that might be located very next to, you know, close to each other. Certainly don't want to be getting in between machines that are, are operating and, and risk your staff. So all of these are, are significant risks and wireless is a great way to, to solve for that. So I'll talk now a bit about our components and our system specifically as a reference, but you know, most of our competitors out there have similar type systems. Um, there's typically four pieces to, to a wireless system, and I'll kind of walk through each, again, with a focus on ours just to, for, for discussion purposes. So at the heart of any wireless system is the receiver. Um, that's a photo of our receiver, and it's got a bit of an interesting heritage. It's not our technology. It was uh, designed by a company called ARA, who does a lot of work with the US government, specifically the Defense Department. And this was originally designed for the Defense Department for uh, tracking troops and incoming threats where those troops are deployed. So they would actually put battery powered sensors in the ground, you know, a half mile, mile out from where the troops were deployed and they could sense in the vibration incoming threats via, you know, tire, uh, a truck incoming, that vibration would be transmitted back to the troops and they'd be aware that something was happening in, in terms of incoming. So we have the exclusive license to this technology for, for use for vibration monitoring. Um, as I just said, it's, it's got a military design and heritage and it's, it's a rock solid technology. Um, all the data that goes into it and goes out of it is secured and encrypted. Our particular system, this receiver, can support 400 channels or sensors you know, per receiver at a broadcast frequency of every eight hours or three readings per day, as I referenced earlier. The output is Ethernet, and you can connect it to either a local area network where the software would be installed, or some customers have chosen to go with just a standalone computer to keep it off the network for a variety of reasons, and you can certainly do that. We have a number of different uh, gain uh, antenna options that you can use depending on the layout of your facility. So we have a, you know, a, a few different alternatives that you can consider, which would give you the best coverage area. 
And what's important to note about our system is that it is not Wi-Fi. It operates at 916 megahertz, which is a, it's not a proprietary frequency band, but it's a bit of a unique band. And the benefit that we get from that is twofold. Um, we get an incredible broadcast range distance with that technology, and I'll talk at length about what that looks like in the upcoming slides. And it also does not cause and has not caused any interference with companies and facilities that have already deployed Wi-Fi for you know, administrative purposes and for other control issues that they might be using wireless and Wi-Fi for in their plant. This operating at 916 kind of on its own plane um, does not cause any interference headaches. And similar to our European radio, which we just launched about a year ago, um, that one operates at 868 megahertz, but the same principles apply. So in terms of uh, sensor options and transducer options, we have a battery powered, powered sensor, which we just call the echo sensor. Um, you'd look to deploy a, a sensor like this where you'd be you know, comparing it against running cable. Um, you would literally mount this unit um, via a stud or a magnet mount. Um, and each unit contains the, the battery pack, the radio, the antenna, um, everything is, is self-contained, self-powered, and you would put that right on, say, for example, a motor bearing, and it would take readings at, at an interval you specify, typically, as I said, three readings per day, take the vibration readings and broadcast them back to the receiver, and it allows you to, you know, just sort of set it and forget it kind of thing. Um, it's ideal for the machinery where you have, you might have a piece moving and you can't run a hardwire cable to it. so. Having a battery powered solution is a, is a great way forward. Um, at three readings per day, we have typically seen battery life of approximately one year. Um, very cold temperatures negatively impact that as does you know, very cold. But on average, you can count on getting one year of battery life out of the battery pack with three readings per day. And in our particular system, you know, the, the Echo system, we do have class one div two versions available of the sensor for use in hazardous areas. So, <clears throat> sort of to the title of our, our session here, but you know, I've already invested in a wired system, you know, how can I convert to wireless? You can certainly leverage your existing investment that you've made in, in your wired accelerometers and many facilities have already done it, um, but there is a path forward and an opportunity for you to convert them. Um, ICP, which is our trademark, or IEPE sensor is basically the same thing. From any manufacturer can potentially be converted easily into a wireless solution. And how is through this thing, which is our Echo Plus wireless junction box. So what this box is, is basically it's a junction box. It's an eight-channel box, and it allows you to connect eight wired accelerometers that you may have already installed and you know they might be terminated on just a traditional static junction box you can replace that junction box re-terminate the eight wired accelerometers to this box and it converts those accelerometers to wireless in the back of the the box there you'll see sort of behind the, the green translucent you know, circuit board is a wireless radio and it's the same technology that's in the battery powered sensors that I just discovered or just discussed a minute ago. So you're effectively converting your, your wired Excels to wireless. And the nice part about our system, at least, is that you can mix and match. You can have some wireless junction boxes, you know, which you've used with your wired accelerometers, as well as some of the battery powered sensors, and you can kind of mix and match them. The system doesn't, doesn't differentiate. Uh, a channel is a channel, whether it's a battery powered sensor or a channel in this box. Now, going with the box as opposed to a battery-powered solution gives you a number of benefits. First and foremost, flexibility with respect to the types of applications you can monitor. A lot of customers have said to me, you know, I've, I've got high temperature type machinery, you know, for example, a dryer section and a paper mill again. You know, I'd love to use wireless, but I can't just because it's high temp. Well, when you look at a solution like this, you can use a high temp accelerometer you know, we've got a, a ton of them, like our HD 602 do one for example. You wire that up to this box, now you're monitoring your high temp application using wireless. 
Another great example of the flexibility that this offers is a submerged application. A customer called and had a pump located five feet underwater, wanted to know what his options were for monitoring it, and I said, well, you can do it wirelessly. And he said, how's that? So just run one of our submersible accelerometers, like our 607 series, um, down to the pump under the water, and then run the cable up to the box, and now you're broadcasting you know, the vibration readings wirelessly. So a lot of flexibility, and we have a ton of different other specialized sensors for use in hazardous areas and whatnot, where you can, if you have an application that requires monitoring, it's very likely that we'd be able to find a sensor that we could connect up to our, our Echo Plus box to allow you to wirelessly monitor that, that piece of machinery. And another nice benefit is that it, it's extremely cost-effective on a per-channel basis especially when you're comparing it against a battery-powered solution. Again, it's an eight-channel box. One of the, uh, the nice things about this is it's 24 volts DC powered. You know, 24 volts DC is pretty omnipresent in most manufacturing facilities nowadays. Um, so you don't have any battery life or battery maintenance concerns or, or costs. And one of the best things about it, one of the best features about it is it functions as a switch box um, where you can connect your handheld data collector um, to a BNC port in there if you had to. So let's say the system detected, you know, an increased elevated vibration level velocity on channel five of the eight channels of this box, and you were notified of that through the software, well, you can go out to this box, open it up, plug your data collector or whatever, you, know, you may be using a 2140 or whatever, into the BNC, cycle through the channels through that little square switch above the BNC I've got called out, and now you're talking directly to the accelerometer that's mounted on that machine, which allows you to then pull the waveform data with your data collector, do an FFT analysis, figure out what the defect is. So our system will tell you that, you know, based on what you've defined as normal vibration levels, it appears that you've got something developing here. It's, it's getting worse. You better take a look at it. It's not going to tell you what it is. That's where you have to connect up to it have the data collector, you know, do the FFT analysis, and then you get into, is it an inner race bearing defect or outer race, whatever. You know, it won't tell you what the defect is, um, but it'll give you the heads up that vibration levels have increased to the point where you might want to get out there and start doing some analysis. And like the battery powered sensor, we also offer a class one div two version of the box. So that's available in North America. So how does that end up looking? So I've got a little diagram here with a couple different scenarios that I just sort of talked through. If you look at configuration one, you'll see, you know, you've got an accelerometer running to one of the, the wireless junction boxes. Again, it's eight channels that you could run to it. Um, and it takes the readings at an interval that you set, typically three readings per day, and broadcasts those vibration levels wirelessly you know, back to the receiver where you can see the antenna is connected and then out to the software it goes. Um, in configuration two, you can see the battery powered sensors. We've got one you know, mounted on the front of that motor. Um, same principle, takes the vibration level readings, broadcasts them back to the receiver, and then you know, all of that gets sent to the software where it's archived and, and trended. And then, as I just described, you can go up to the junction box with your analyzer plug in and then start doing some, some fault analysis if, if needed. So while it's true that you can use any manufacturer's um, 100 millivolt per G, you know, ICP or IEPE accelerometers with the system, um, what we found is you may run into some issues with what we call spiking, um, which are erroneously high readings that aren't really, you know, high readings at all, just, you know, something's causing that to happen. And, you know, we've seen it in variable frequency drives and some other equipment, so to solve for that, IMI developed um, an accelerometer. Here, here's one of them. We have a, a whole range in this product line, uh, 603M170, which has some filtering in it. So this sensor was designed to be used exclusively with the Echo Plus junction box, and it eliminates you know any of the the uh, spiking issues that that may occur. So it is true you can use any manufacturers, but we strongly suggest you know looking at our 603M170 or other in other sensors in the series, and we probably have seven or eight for different for different environments.
So we talk about it taking the readings and broadcasting them. Well, what is it actually reading and what is it actually broadcasting? So it's taking readings, and again, we'll use the three readings per day scenario, overall vibration levels for trending purposes in terms of RMS velocity, RMS acceleration, true peak acceleration, and crest factor. Um, all of those are simultaneously taken and broadcast from both you know, the junction box as well as the sensor, the battery powered sensor, and sent to the, the receiver and then fed out to the software. So I won't you know, sort of read through the definitions of these, but the reason we chose these particular parameters is they're probably the most common you know, vibration parameters looked at um, when you're looking at a route-based scenario to look at the readings to see if you know, velocity for typically lower frequency defects that are developing, acceleration for higher frequency type defects. So the system basically covers all of the, the areas that you might be interested in. Um, it's important to, to look at you know, both low frequency as well as high frequency um, for, for fault detection, and you know, this system allows you to do that. So where it all comes together is in the software. Okay, um, basically the essence of the system is all of those readings are taken from either the junction box or the battery powered sensor, broadcast back to the receiver and then the output of that gets fed into the software. And every, every reading, if you will, is archived in the software in a standard you know, Microsoft SQL database file and it's trended. So literally from the tiniest turn on the system, every broadcast reading is, is archived and trended. So the essence of the system is you'd like to understand what normal vibrations look like. So what we recommend people do is when you install a wireless system, let it run for at least two or three weeks to understand what normal vibration levels for that particular asset look like. And you'll see that kind of depicted in the right in the diagram under the yellow warning level alert line. All of that, you know, on the left, those, those data points, each one represents a reading represents what normal vibration looks like. And as you'll see, you know, as a defect develops and worsens, the vibration levels tend to increase, and you can see that depicted in the trend lines increasing. So what the system does for you, and really to summarize what it does for you, is it gives you a heads up that those vibration levels have increased to the point where it's gonna notify you at the yellow warning, critical warning, or I'm sorry, warning level alert line, and then the red is a critical level alert line, which you, know, you can set for whatever levels for each of those vibration parameters that you'd like, depending on what machine it is that you're monitoring. And it basically you know, monitors your, your machinery and it lets you know if the vibration levels have approached those, those two warning areas, and it'll give you a notification if it breaches them. So it'll notify you a couple ways. Um, we have what we call an overview screen, which I'll show you on the next slide. And it's a traditional sort of you know, green, yellow, red type scenario where you know, green is good, yellow is warning level, and red is critical. So you can visually see that, which I'll show you in a sec. And it'll also, it being the software, can be programmed to send you a text message alert or an email alert when those alarms have been triggered. So again, everything gets plotted, everything gets archived, even signal strength, you know, the sensors and the battery status, all of that is, is you know, brought together into the software and displayed for you. Um, it should be noted if you're looking to integrate into, you know, other systems in your facility that you may have already deployed, um, you know, software systems or even hardware systems for that matter, if those systems can accept a Modbus interface and can communicate over Modbus, you can have the R system at least talk directly to those software systems and, and hardware systems over Modbus. Most of our customers install the, the software on a local area network to allow for you know, remote access to the data, et cetera. But as I said earlier, some have actually deployed it on a dedicated standalone BC, PC as well. So this is uh, the, the overview screen that I referenced, and we like to use the phrase at a glance monitoring of your entire plant, which is really kind of what it offers you. Pretty much every one of our customers has deployed, you know, for example, a 42 inch monitor and the reliability and maintenance groups, you know, maybe lunchroom or, or you know, the area where they congregate. 
And you can literally walk by the screen and if you see all green, each one of those rectangles in the, on the left there represents an asset being monitored with our wireless system. Um, if you see all green, that basically tells you everything is operating in that healthy band that you've kind of defined for each piece of machinery. If you see any of the rectangles yellow, you know that those particular machines have gone warning level alert on you. And you can see on the right, you know, what would trigger a warning level alert there. And that's customizable for, for each asset that you're monitoring. And finally, if you see red on the overview screen on any of those rectangles, you know that those particular machines have gone critical based on what you've defined as a critical alert level or a vibration level for each of the parameters. And I think, you know, when I mentioned efficiency earlier, that's where you'd want to focus. I mean, it just seems silly to go out there and take vibration levels with a handheld data collector on everything that's green there when you know it's operating at normal vibration levels. Warning level stuff, you can maybe sort of make a note of, but the red critical alerts and alarms, you're definitely going to want to get out there and start doing some analysis of what's going on. Here's another screenshot. Um, just basically shows how the, the software presents itself. So if you click on an asset that you're monitoring, all of the vibration parameters are shown simultaneously. So if you see an alert, you know, you can look into it quickly and see what triggered it. You know, on this particular example, we're looking at a pump. And on the lower left, you can see it, you know, broke through on true peak acceleration. And that's what triggered that particular alarm. So it gives you a little bit of a, a heads up in terms of what might be going on probably you know, higher frequency type issue. In terms of availability of our system, this is a fairly complex um, area. Um, because we don't use Wi-Fi, which is kind of a universally accepted you know, wireless standard, we do use the 916 megahertz radio in North America and the 868 megahertz radio in Europe. Um, there's approvals and there's allowable, you know, bandwidth in each country. And some countries require very specific frequencies um, in terms of their allocated bandwidth and spectrum. So currently, as I said, you know, ARA owns this technology and we license it from them. We have solutions for countries that accept the 916 megahertz radio as well as the 868. I've listed the countries where we currently are offering our, our Echo wireless system for sale. Um, some of them listed there require some, you know, certifications, which usually takes three or four weeks to get, which we're working through. But any of the countries I've, I've listed there in that, that key, um, the system would be available you know, sort of readily, if you will. Um, other areas like, you know, for example, China or Japan or Pakistan, you, you name it, you know, we'd have to research what the radio requirements were. And if it was not 868 or not 916, we'd have to work with ARA to understand, you know, could we produce another radio that would allow us to operate in those countries illegally? You know, and we would have to go through the certification process to, to do that, um, which we certainly would, would look at if there were, you know, enough opportunities to, to warrant that expense and, and effort. So one of the most important things that you'll want to think about when you're looking at a wireless system is range. Um, when you're evaluating you know, our system or anybody's system, broadcast range and signal strength, are, it's probably, in my opinion, you're the two most extremely important considerations you'll want to you'll want to look at. I mean, if you buy a system without it being tested in your facility, and you think it's going to broadcast at a certain distance, and it doesn't, when it's actually installed, you know that's a problem. Um, with many systems. Investment in signal amplifiers and gateways are required. You know, a lot of the systems that operate on Wi-Fi require you know, gateways and amplifiers just to get the signal from point A to point B. Our system is point to point. We don't need any of that, and you don't have any of the expense and any of the maintenance headaches associated with that additional equipment. So in terms of a pro tip, if you will, if no matter who you're talking to about their wireless solution, always ask for an on-site demo of the system, and more importantly, do a broadcast range test in your facility with their system. You know, just doing that simple step will give you the confidence that the system should perform if you decide to you know, go forward with it and purchase it as expected. You don't want to be surprised after the fact.
So, you know, we, a long time ago here at PCV and IMI, started incorporating site surveys and range tests for any of the customers that we're talking to who are interested in our wireless system. And usually, the, you know, the site survey involves walking the plant with the customer and, you know, identifying what their needs are and the coverage area, just the general physical layout of the facility. Um, we understand what they're currently using, if they're currently using, you know, our sensors or our competitors' wired sensors or, you know, whatever's going on currently. And then we can start, you know, creating a plan for any additional sensors that they might need for, for what they're trying to accomplish. The broadcast range is, uh, you know, you have to understand the overall distance that requires coverage, not just sort of a concentrated area in, in the facility. And you have to think down the road if they want to expand, you know, will one receiver cover all of their assets if they decide to free up some additional capital down the road and, and scale it up with, you know, covering additional points with the wireless system. So, you know, it really comes down to communicating with the customer in terms of what their you know, facility needs are what their current pains are, you know, if they're having, you know, machinery fail, what's what's causing it, and putting together a comprehensive plan of attack, if you will, that, that may or may not include wireless. So with respect to broadcast range, as I said, it's one of the more important issues you want to look at or, or considerations. Um, these are a couple examples of site surveys and range tests that we've done over the years. This one represents a paper mill. The problem there was they needed to create, you know, a wireless solution and they had a 1200 foot range requirement. So what you're looking at there is the blue, the dark blue circle in the middle represents where we set up the radio and the light blue areas represents all the, the assets that they were looking to monitor. So even, you know, installing the antenna and the receiver inside a building, we were able to pick up, you know, the 20 points with a 1200 foot range, no problem. This is a chemical plant example. Um, what they wanted to put a, a wireless system in with uh, pretty much sensors all over their facility, which is a very large facility. Problem is they, their control room was in the upper right-hand corner there, depicted by the dark blue circle. So not really ideal from a range standpoint. You know, ideally you'd want that to be located more centrally to the points that they're looking to monitor. But we were able to set up the system and show them that we could get the range of all of the points they were looking to monitor, you know, even with that poor receiver and, and, and antenna location. Another quick example, a power gen station. Um, they wanted to implement a wireless system, you know, monitor their rotating assets, and they had different sort of sub-locations on their property. They had 30 points that they were looking to monitor, and we were able to, to get you know, stellar results even at that farthest upper left blue point, uh, which was a point located inside a small metal building, which was inside another building, you know, over 1,200 feet, and we were still able to pick it up and, and get them the data they were looking for. So just a few examples of, of how that broadcast range can become very important. And then just for fun, this was something we did several years ago, a coworker, um, and I set up a system at our headquarters here in Depew, New York, that blue square represents where the system was set up at our head office. And we decided to have, you know, my coworker throw a battery powered sensor in his car and he just started driving. So he drove up the road, you know, turned right and we just wanted to see how far the signal would continue to broadcast before it fell, fell off or dropped off. And he got a mile and a half away, which is pretty impressive for, for wireless technology. So we're running a bit short on time, so I won't go through this uh, summary. It's basically uh, just a quick summation of everything I, I've already sort of walked through with respect to, you know, point-to-point -point system, uh, technology that we use in ours, uh, the transmission broadcast range, it's alarm-based monitoring, the trending, et cetera, et cetera. And I just really wanted to cover quickly this application. This was a, an actual customer that, of mine. I was a polymer manufacturer and they manufacture you know, plastic or polymer pellets that ultimately end up being you know, Coke bottles or, or Pepsi bottles, that kind of thing. They have a large motor, actually two of them, and the top of that tower you see on the left, I actually took that picture of their facility, and one of the motors caught on fire and caused a huge PR disaster for the company. So ever since then, they you know sort of vowed to do diligent vibration monitoring on all of their assets to avoid that from ever happening again. 
So they initially deployed 90 sensors, um, 10 Echo Plus boxes, which are eight channels each, and 10 of the battery powered sensors for a total of 90 points. And you can see this is the motor at the top of that tower that I just referenced that had previously caught fire. You, we put two battery powered sensors on, you know, on each end and it was on a interval of three readings per day. And within one year, our, our system caught six bearing faults that would have gone catastrophic on them again. So needless to say, they're very pleased with the system. They were also kind enough to share this this data, which I think is, is a great slide. And uh, I've talked to our sales guys and, and mentioned if I can only use one slide to discuss what our system does, this would be it. Again, this is actual data from that customer. If you look on top, you're looking at the, the trend lines, you're looking at peak velocity. If you look on bottom, you're looking at acceleration, true peak acceleration. If you're just monitoring velocity, um, nothing looks askew there. I mean, the vibration levels look nice and and, and level on the left on top, but if you look at what's going on on the, on the lower half of that with respect to through peak acceleration, very different story. You can see the system broke through the warning level alert line early on, then it broke through critical, and it continued. They, they let the system run for a while until they got to their scheduled shutdown, which you can see both on top and on bottom drops to zero. They changed out the bearing, which had issues, which the, the system gave them a heads up that those issues were developing. And look how the vibration signature smooths out after they change the bearing on both you know, velocity and acceleration. So in essence, one slide, this is what our system or hopefully any wireless system will do for you. It will show you that those defects are developing. They're in fact getting worse and it gives you time to respond to them and hopefully get to it, you know, to avoid a, a catastrophic failure, which could be production impacting and, and shut you down. Here's another screen shot of uh, an actual deployment, a customer is monitoring a pump and you can see in the, the trend line, it was running along just nicely. And all of a sudden, for some reason, the vibrations level started to shoot up broke through warning level, broke through critical level, they decided to shut it down and change out the bearing. And you can see on the right-hand side, it, uh, it smoothed out quite nicely. Here's another example. This is a customer who's monitoring a fan. Same scenario, you can see the vibration levels in the trend line creeping up and creeping up and they continue to let it run. Then they ultimately said, okay, something's not right here. They shut it down, changed it out, and look how the vibration level smoothed out after they, they changed it out. This was also a bearing. And then this is a photo of the polymer plant where you can see the, uh, the Echo Plus junction box called out in the center there with the yellow 24 volts DC power running to it. And I've also got the wired accelerometers called out, um, which are running back to that box. And this is a typical deployment, you know, it's outdoors, you know, greasy, you know, kind of nasty environment. You know, just try and picture yourself walking around in that mess with a 2140 trying to grab, you know, vibration readings on a route. It's just, it's madness. So we were able to solve, uh, solve that problem for them quite nicely using the, the Echo Plus box. And real quick, we have another option available with our, our Echo Plus junction box um, called the Trigger. And the genesis of this was we had a customer who challenged us to come up with a way for them to monitor overhead cranes. And you know, quite frankly, this could be used for any machine that is running non-continuously. You know, for example, a CNC machine. Sometimes it's running, sometimes it's not. And even with a system like ours, it wakes up three or even six times a day. Sometimes the machine will be running and you'll get vibration data, sometimes it won't you'll get zeros and it's gonna completely mess up your trend line and it won't be usable. So what this does is it allows you to take with the remote trigger option, vibration readings on demand. So when you know that the asset or the machine is running, you can force it to take an on-demand vibration reading and broadcast it back to, to the software where you can get usable trend line data from that. And most recently, you know, previously you had to actually push a button, which you can see on the right-hand side that's hardwired into the junction box to force the reading to wake up and take the readings on demand. 
or you could use, it's kind of like a garage door opener, a wireless system to trigger the system. Um, but most recently, we've, we've set it up where you can now have your PLC or DCS can initiate that sort of on-demand push the button, if you will, to trigger an on-demand reading. Um, so if your you know, PLC knows that the crane is running, you can have it set to, to trigger the, the, the system to, to take that reading on demand so you'll get usable vibe data. And this is a, a coming soon um, option that we're going to be making available with our, our system, the Echo system. We've partnered with a company out of Minnesota called Exosite um, to allow cloud-based access to the Echo data. Um, a lot of our customers have asked, you know, is there any way that I could get this from home on the weekends, on my iPad, you know, that kind of thing. If I have a bad actor, you know, something, uh, a machine's acting up and I'd like to just keep an eye on it, it'd be great if I didn't have to go in to sort of have a look at what's going on with the, you know, the, the standalone system, the ecosystem. This will allow customers to have that cloud-based remote access via iPhone, iPad, or laptop, um, and we're looking at launching this probably by mid to late March. Um, Exosite's been a tremendous partner working with us on developing this along with uh, our software architect based in our California location who wrote our software for the ecosystem. So you can see you know, locally, you, you, this is what you normally see on our system through the software that we sell with Echo. And on the right, you can do some pretty interesting things in terms of getting relevant data that's important to you um, over the cloud through your iPhone, iPad, or laptop at home or wherever you may be traveling. So we're looking to launch that, like I said, probably mid to late March and uh, more information on that will be available shortly. So summary, you know, why would you consider wireless? I sort of started with that question. As I said, it definitely reduces downtime and lost productivity. I sort of walked through how that's possible. Um, with the increased sample rate, you know, three, three readings per day, six readings per day, as opposed to once or, you know, once a month, once a quarter, you're definitely going to catch defects sooner. Um, as I've discussed, it frees up your technical experts for fault analysis, as opposed to them wasting time on taking vibration readings with a, a data collector on healthy machinery. Um, it eliminates a lot of the risk that you, you know, staff could be exposed to with respect to dangerous and unsafe environments. Um, reduces your monitoring costs overall at, you know, for a number of reasons we walk through. Um, you can monitor equipment that's remote, difficult to access. Uh, certainly simplifies installation if you're, you're looking at you know, wireless as opposed to running cable, much more cost effective. Um, you can monitor a lot more assets with less human resources. As I said, that you know, refinery with the 55,000 points, they needed help. And it certainly keeps the, the staff safe, you know, allows you to apply with current regulations and uh, it allows for remote monitoring of, of machinery. Um, and now with uh, the Exosite partnership, we'll be able to offer a cloud-based solution for, for our system. Well, I'd just like to say thanks again to, to you, Emily, and the folks at the Modal Shop for facilitating this. And I'd like to thank everyone on the call for attending. And if you uh, do have any questions, you want to email me or or call me directly, I'd be happy to work with you. Um, other, other than that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.